good evening. My name is Professor Gad Barzilai. I am Lucia and Air Puzan Chair of Jewish Studies and Chair of Jewish Studies uh, program, and it's an honor to open this special uh, event um, uh, dedicated to naming our uh, JSP program as Samuel and Althea Strom Program of Jewish Studies. We are, uh, sure, sure. Uh, we begin uh, with a lecture, and let me first of all uh, say to all of you, dear Althea, dear Strom family members, uh, board members, faculty members, students, um, uh, it's a pleasure to open uh, this, se this session. It has been over about 30 years uh, since Morey Schiff uh, blessed his memory, uh, then executive director of the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle, and Edward Alexander, uh, chair of the Jewish Studies Committee at the UDA, at the University of Washington, got an idea that was uh, ambitious. And the idea was to bring to the UW every year a very distinguished scholar to speak about topics of uh, Jewish studies. However, uh, he was looking for somebody to help us to promote that kind uh, of, of uh, lecture series, and he was uh, denied uh, until uh, one day he met uh, Samuel uh, Strom. Uh, who supported the series to be known as the lectureship, uh, as Althea and Samuel Strom lectureship, lectureship in Jewish studies. Now, this lectureship is very special since, since it is covering diversity of issues. Just to mention a few issues that under the generosity of Samuel and Althea Strom, uh, we could uh, organize uh, lectures about biblical studies, literature, archaeology, uh, history, Holocaust study, Hebrew studies, Israel studies, cultural and language studies. All of that could not have uh, been, uh, all of it could not have been organized without the unmatched uh, generosity of Althea and Samuel Strom. Today, uh, we have a very distinguished speaker with us, Professor Yael Zubavel. I would also like to congratulate her spouse, Professor Eviatar Zubavel, who is also going to give a lecture in a colloquia by the sociology department on Monday. Uh, and Yael will talk about encounters with the past, how we are dealing with the past. And the past is obviously might be very ambivalent, very convulted. Uh, let me uh, introduce Yael Zubavel uh, to you. Yael received her PhD from University of Pennsylvania in cultural and folklore studies. She is currently the founding director of the Jewish studies program at Rutgers University. She has published many books and articles. I would like just to mention one of her books, it is being called Recovered Roots, um, Collective Memory and the Making of Israel National Tradition, which is a highly cited uh, book. Her lecture today would be about bridges to antiquity, and uh, she would also use uh, different pictures to exemplify her arguments. Ladies and gentlemen, let me invite the 2009 Althea and Samuel Strom uh, lecture, Professor Yael Zubavel. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. It's a great honor to be invited to deliver the Strom lectures and I would like to thank the Jewish Studies Program for this invitation. And more than anyone else, I want to thank Althea Strom for having the foresight with your late husband Samuel to establish this great series that has an international reputation. It really is wonderful. <laughs> I 
I would like to thank uh, Professor Gad Barzilai and Jennifer Cohen <laughs> for their wonderful welcome and hospitality. <laughs> Professor Paul, Ber Paul Burstein, who extended this invitation initially as the former chair, and Professor M uh, Joel Migdal and Naomi Sokolov, from whose scholarship I've benefited over the years. The theme of these lectures, Encounters with the Past, Remembering Israel, the Bygone in Israeli Culture, reveals my long, long time uh, interest in memory studies. Some of the key questions that lie at the heart of my scholarly work are the product of my focus on Israeli society. And the questions that I've been asking are, how is collective memory formed and transformed over time? How does a society create a vivid memory of a distant past? How does a society cope with a fragmented history representing different geographical, political, social, and cultural conditions to create a sense of historical continuity? And last but not least, how does the perception of the past shape our understanding of the present? And conversely, how does the present shape and influence our view of the past. The strong lectures provide me with the opportunity and the challenge to explore the evolution of Israeli collective memory from a much broader <coughs> historical perspective as each lecture focuses on the transformation of memory at, on one particular uh, period. In this first lecture, I'm going to focus on Israeli society's effort to symbolically reintroduce antiquity into the present, to highlight its direct continuity from that past, and to establish a unifying national tradition. In the second lecture on Tuesday, I will address the other side of the same process, namely the desire to distance the new Jewish society from exile, from Galut, and the different ways in which new venues of reconnecting with this past um, and its diverse traditions during the recent decades. So in each of these lectures, I will, I will actually explore the changes in the attitude towards these uh, periods. In the third lecture, I will address the recent drive to commemorate the Isra Israeli society's formative years that now appear to have become an old past. The analysis of current commemorative trends suggests divergent approaches to the memory of this past. So I'm switching to the topic of today, bridges to antiquity. National movements typically search for a favored period in the past that can be raised as a source of legitimacy and inspiration. The Zionist designation of antiquity as its golden age followed the historical path of earlier national movements in Europe that had constructed their national memory by, by highlighting an ancient modern axis. A decline narrative presents a period of degeneration that follows the golden age, which the national movement typically seeks to reverse the direction by calling for a symbolic return to an earlier golden age. The challenge, the challenge is for that society to create the ideological construct of continuity between two periods that are separated by long history of absence, both imaginable and meaningful. The success of a national movement, therefore, depends on the thickness um, of, its of its mnemonic tradition that renders the ancient past relevant, evocative, and accessible. Like other national movements, the Jewish, Jewish memory had to address the issue of a temporal gap, in this case, stretching over 18 centuries from antiquity to the modern Zionist return to, to the homeland. Unlike other movements, however, being exiled also introduced a geographical gap. The pursuit of a national future thus meant a double journey over time and space. That meant a concrete horizontal move to return to the homeland from various diasporas and a symbolic vertical move to reconnect symbolically with the ancient past. The renewal paradigm 
offered a useful strategy for negotiating the desire for change and the need to preserve a sense of historical continu continuity. Zionism preserved the traditional Jewish memory of antiquity and exile as representing a positive and a negative meaning. Of course, antiquity positive and exile negative. But it transformed the interpretive framework of relating to these periods from traditional religious perspective to a modern secular nationalist perspective. The multiplicity of commemorative sites and mnemonic practices associated with antiquity that developed in the Hebrew culture indicates its privileging in Zionist memory as a source of political legitimation, as well as a tool to highlight the common origins and inspire the construction of a unified national culture, which was particularly important for a society of immigrants coming from diverse cultural backgrounds. Multiple bridges to antiquity have been constructed simultaneously on various cultural levels um, in order to represent um, and create a thick overlay of ties between the present and the past. They included an emphasis on the physical continuity from the ancient past through relics, the creation of replicas of ancient figures and forms that reintroduce the past into the, into the uh, present through iconic representation and the development of new symbolic forms that are new and do not imitate ancient forms, but everyone interprets them symbolically as representing the past. The land of Israel played a primary role of physically representing a direct continuity from antiquity to the present. This status had turned the land into a major site of Jewish memory, national memory. The Zionist movement early, early images of the promised land in posters, photos, and films, as you can see on the screen, um, drew heavily on European reimagining of the, of the Holy Land and its Orientalist landscape, presenting a mythical and pastoral landscape marked by palm trees and herds, camels and tents, and Bedouin-like figures, as if time had been suspended since antiquity to the present. Zionist poems, songs, and art still in Europe, but also in the early, in the early Zionist period, during the, er, the, settle, the early settlement years, continued this mythical landscape and its nature along these lines. The encounter with Palestine, however, was different. The European Jewish immigrants were often shocked or disappointed by the inevitable incongruity between the mythical representations of the land and what they perceived as a barren landscape and the hard and unfamiliar conditions of life in the Middle East. These gaps reinforced to highlight, served to highlight the impact of exile, not only on the people, but on the land, which turned into a desolate land, a desert. In reality, Palestine offered a variety of landscapes, Arab farming villages, some bustling middle, town, uh, middle Eastern towns, yet the view of the land as a symbolic desert by the early settlers and, the, and the, during the Yishuv period, the settlement, uh, the pre-state uh, years, reinforced the renewal paradigm. The Zionist revival, therefore, would lead to a double redemption of the people and the land. The worship of the land as a site of national memory led to the rise of hikes as a ritual form that established a direct physical contact with the land and the past and represented the essence of reclaiming the ties to the homeland. Schools and youth movements regarded the physical act of hiking through the landscape as an important educational experience, offering a symbolic communion with nature and with their ancestors who had lived in the same land. Visit, visiting sites infused with historical and mythical meanings was particularly evocative. The custom of taking along ancient texts, the Hebrew Bible, Josephus' writing, were popular practices during these hikings. Ancient relics provided the most concrete and tangible, um, re uh, uh, tangible bridge to the bygone past. 
Descriptions of ancient figures reappearing to establish a direct contact with the modern descendants were the product of visitors' stirred imagination or were used as a literary trope, as I've discussed in greater detail elsewhere. The connection between archaeology and nationalism has long been recognized and explored cross-culturally. Archaeology often becomes a national tool to provide physical evidence in support of national claims. Its growing pop popular appeal for the Jewish Society of Palestine emerged in the 1930s and reached its peak in the 1950s and the 1960s with volunteers' enthusiastic participation in archaeological digs, the large public participation in archaeological meetings, discoveries receiving a prominent place on national news and involvement of major Israeli political figures such as President Ben Tzvi, Prime Minister David Ben Gurion, um, and former chiefs of staff Moshe Dayan and Igal Yadin, who turned into an archaeologist later, contributed to the prestige of the field of archaeology. The sacred character of archaeological sites and relics is encoded in the law to protect them and their display in national, in, in national and local museum. Their veneration is most clearly manifested in the lofty name selected for the building of the Israel Museum that houses the Dead Sea Scrolls and other ancient texts, which is called the Shrine of the Book, Hechal HaSefer, um, articulating its sacred role as a civil temple. The unearthing of ancient, ancient relics or sites in the process of establishing a new settlement or building a new home or working in the fields was a familiar phenomenon in Israel. And it became a common trope in, lit, in literary and cinematic settlement narratives. In the Zionist film, My Father's House, that was written, the script was written by Mayor Levin, who also published a book by this title, a child who survived the Holocaust is brought to a kibbutz but runs away in search of his father. When he learns that his father is dead, he was murdered in the Holocaust, he suffers a nervous breakdown, as if going through a symbolic death. During his recovery, when the kibbutz members discover an ancient stone engraved with the same Hebrew name as his father's, Halevi, the young man, the young kibbutznik who serves as his, as his surrogate father, tells the boy, We'll build our house on this stone here, in this settlement. We'll call it the House of Halevi. The integration of the ancient remains with the modern environment provides a visual concrete form to the Zionist renewal paradigm and the theme of death and rebirth. That's, of course, from a much later period, that a picture that I took in Be'er Sheva, but you see the same integration of the ancient and the, and the modern. The creation of modern replicas of ancient forms offers a generic resemblance to the originals, which are no longer available, in order to reintroduce the past through the process of imitation. The iconic representation of antiquity first appeared as a grassroots activity and added another dimension when the State of Israel was, f was founded and adapted ancient forms as part of its official iconography. To display their identity change into the ancient new role of natives of the homeland, Zionist settlers and their children adapted local cultural traits from the local Arab population to note or to mark their transformation into natives. The choice of Arabs, especially the Bedouins, to serve as a model of the ancient Hebrews was long practiced by Christian artists and adapted by Bezalel school artists. The head of the Bezalel School of the Arts, Boris Schatz, used to walk in the streets of Jerusalem wearing a white Arab overcoat. Members of Hashomer Underground, a, a guard association formed in 1909, and similarly wore kafiyas and hybrid dress that created an Arabized look mixed with Eastern European influences to display the new identity. Jewish orphans from the 1903 Kishinev pogrom posed for a group photo a year after arrive, their arrival to Palestine with white Arab kafiyas, head, headdress, as if to display the success of their symbolic transformation from the victims of the pogrom to new natives. 
The Arab Kefia as a marker of a native identity was common among members of the socialist youth movements and the Palmach underground. And here we see the display in the Haganah Museum, and this is taken from their uh, brochure. The reenactment of antiquity was expressed through a wide range of folk, popular, and artistic performances in which contemporary Jews symbolically transform into ancient figures by wearing ancient-like, ancient-style clothing. These dramatic reenactments were an important aspect of the Hebrew culture featured in school plays, artistic productions, and folk dances. And one could bring a lot of visual, uh, visual materials to support that uh, development. The State of Israel gave a more formal expression to the use of replicas of ancient forms. The central emblem of the state, the ancient seventh-branched menorah, is based on the second temple menorah that had been looted by the Romans at the time that the, that the temple was destroyed and was brought to Rome. The actual menorah had been lost, but its image had been preserved on the Arch of Titus. You can see it there. Its choice as the inspiration for the state's emblem thus symbolically rescues the exiled menorah and returns it to its homeland. But it also transforms its function from a religious item to a central icon of, of Israeli sovereignty. Another example is the adoption of, an, of the ancient, ancient Jewish coin, the shekel, as a contemporary Israeli currency in 1970. The Ministry of Tourism's logo drawn the biblical story of the, to, of the spies that Joshua sent to Canaan to tour the land, focusing on the two who came back with a positive appraisal carrying the fruit of the land. The reproduction of images of antiquities on stamps and medals similarly provides symbolic continuity with the ancient past. The reconstruction of symbolic bridges between the present and antiquity is the most extensively used strategy to highlight continu the continuity between them. The revival of the Hebrew language offered an ideological message of returning to the ancient roots and also a pragmatic solution to providing a common language to Jews who spoke different languages. Its modernization created a symbolic continuity from the biblical Hebrew but contributed to the cultural shift from a religious to a secular national tradition. Name changing from non-Hebrew exilic names to Hebrew ones and the tendency during the pre-state period to follow the biblical form X the son of Y, like David Green turned into David Ben-Gurion or Yitzhak Ben-Tzvi, uh, clearly suggests the, ren the renewal process. Similarly, <laughs> Similarly, settlement names such as those of the first Aliyaz Moshevot drew on biblical phrases such as Petach Tikva, Voshpina, Nes Tziona, and Rishon Lezion. The, the Hebraization of the landscape with newly founded settlement as a way of reestablishing the broken con continuity with the past was further reinforced by changing Arabic names to Hebrew ones. The reborn landscape and it's not my own invention, going back to antiquity has clearly served the political agenda of highlighting Jews' more ancient roots in the land and erasing the Arab past that supports Palestinians' competing claim of ownership over the land. The popular reference to, the, to youth as grandchildren of the ancient Hebrews highlights the genealogical continuity between them bracketing off the generation of exilic parents. And as you can see, you see the ancient figure with the modern figure behind him. Posters, literary, uh, uh, literary and educational texts, the popular discourse, and popular discourse often portrayed the ancient figure as a model and an inspiration for the modern Hebrew. The famous second Aliyah poet, Rachel, or Rachel, um, articulated her intense identification with her biblical namesake in a poem entitled Rachel, Rachel, um, which she wrote in 1926. Her blood runs in my veins, her voice sings within me. Rachel, the shepherd of Laban's, Laban's sheep, Rachel, the matriarch. 
הן דמה בדמי זורם, הן קולה בירן, רחל הרואה צאן לבן, רחל אם האם. Just for the sound of the Hebrew. Like the modern building that contains ancient stones, the modern Rachel is symbolically fused with the ancient Rachel, embodying the continuity with, with antiquity. The symbolic fusion of ancient and modern, on the modern received an unusual expression when the state of Israel provided a military funeral to the remains of the Masada zealots. As if they were soldiers of the Israel Defense Forces, a similar funeral to the Bar Kokhba fighters remains followed in 1982. Whereas the 1969 ceremony represented the spirit of cooperation between the government, archaeologists, rabbis, and the army around the significance of ties with antiquity for Israeli national commemorations, by 1982, the same ritual failed to bring to a similar collaboration. Instead, its performance highlighted internal frictions between the right and the left, between archaeologists and rabbis, and evoked harsh, cri harsh criticism from different perspectives. Undoubtedly, the symbolic continuity from antiquity has remained central to Israeli national memory, and the commemoration of Israel's roots in antiquity has continued to be ingrained in, Is in, in the state's official memory, in Jewish religious texts, holidays and rituals, and public commemoration. Yet, since the 1970s, the mystique of antiquity has lost much of its popular appeal. The decline of the popular interest in archeology span and the study of the Bible has been widely noted. Israel is born following the 1967 watershed take their Israeli identity as a given and do not search for models to prove their native roots um, and, the, and take for granted the vibrant Hebrew culture, uh, while other minorities, immigrants, may still continue to speak the Hebrew language. But you don't need any more the fight and the proof of the, of the roots in the land. The remarkable development of modern Hebrew during the 20th century has distanced nat native Hebrew speakers so far away from the biblical Hebrew that an Israeli linguist Gilad Zuckerman, or Zuckerman in Hebrew, has recently argued that the language spoken in Israel is a different language that should be identified as Israeli, or in Hebrew, Israelite. Thus, the modern Israelite, or Israeli, according to Zuckerman, is a hybrid language shaped by both Hebrew and Yiddish, and to a lesser extent by other European languages since Yiddish was the mother tongue of many of the earlier Jewish immigrants and thus made a stronger impact on Israeli's language than has been acknowledged, and Zuckerman claims that this is for ideological reasons, of course. Another manifestation of the growing disparity between biblical and contemporary Hebrew is the recent publication of a new translation and I'm saying translation, that's the, the way that, it's, I, that it is defined. The translation of the Bible to modern Hebrew. The publisher explained that the translation was needed because ancient Hebrew has become like a foreign language. <laughs> it is interesting to note that the author of this translation is an 87-year-old Bible teacher a former school principal who is also a Holocaust survivor and a kibbutz member. In other words, he has all the credentials of a good Israeli. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody can say it's a young person, you know, post-Zionist who doesn't care. And this, and this teacher explained his motivation in educational terms, saying that his desire was to allow teachers to devote more time for the discussion of the meaning of the Bible because so much time was taken by just explaining the, the, the words. The supervisor of Bible studies at Israel's Ministry of Education was nevertheless outraged and called the publication scandalous and a disaster and banned, and banned its use from schools. The politicization of the memory of antiquity has been a major factor in the decline of the popular appeal of antiquity in the post-1967 era. 
Although in the immediate aftermath of the war, the rediscovery of historical Jewish sites going back to the Bible and to ancient Israel was largely shared in Israeli public, the debate over the future of the occupied territories soon turned the commemoration of ancient roots in these regions from a unified national strategy to a highly divisive issue. Accordingly, the Israeli right has raised the claim for Jewish sovereignty over the post-1967 territories as the historical cradle of the Hebrew na nation and an integral part of the biblical land of Israel, Eretz Israel. Jewish led settlers in the West Bank and Gaza mobilized Israeli national traditions and commemorative practices to promote the right's political agenda. They included the mobilization of the Bible, archaeology, the hiking tradition, and the settlement ethos. As, Mike, as uh, Michael Feige, recent book, Settling in the Hearts, demonstrates, the mobilization of key Israeli national myths, such as Tel Chai and Masada, was particularly pronounced around the, re the resistance to the withdrawal from Sinai in the early 80s and the withdrawal from Gaza in 2005 as I discussed in greater length in my book, Recovered Roots. Although similar strategies had been accepted as legitimizing and unifying during the pre-1967 era, the left has protested against applying them beyond the green line. That is to say the name of the Israel, the reference to the Israel pre-1967 borders. In support of control, in, and they, they objected to their support of control over a large a Palestinian population, uh, the establishment of Jewish settlements, which obstructs peace negotiations with the Palestinians, and claims for future sovereignty. The political rift within Israeli society has thus corroded the attachment to commemorative sites and practices relating to antiquity that had been largely accepted as validating the Jewish settlement process and the struggle for a Jewish state prior to 48. From the late 1970s to the, to the 1990s, public debates over the interpretation of key Israeli national myths, biblical narratives, and the memory of antiquity became so intense that this trend was labeled as myth shattering, or in Hebrew, niputz mitosim, largely used, the phrase used by its critics, of course. In the face of a no noticeable decline of public interest in antiquity, the greater initiative to develop new commemorative practices related to that past has come from the tourist and entertainment industries. Clearly, tourism to Israel has always been closely linked to pilgrimage to the Holy Land and its ancient religious sites uh, have always served as major tourist attractions. So this is not new in itself. But in the post-1967 era, with Christian and Jewish tourism to Israel on the rise, the tourist industry has expanded the marketing of antiquity through different venues. And I'm going to show some examples of how it has been used. The tourist industry has extended the use of earlier mnemonic strategies and applies them to marketing its products. Thus, the publicity for archeological and historical sites highlights the theme of relics reintroducing the ancient past into the present and suggests that by entering their space, visitors would be transported into the past. The symbolic vertical move that into the past that I referred to earlier is thus adapted almost literally by the so-called, and that's the name, Time Elevator Jerusalem that offers a ride, I quote, from the depth of earth into, to the sky to allow visitors to experience 3,000 years of Jerusalem. The, hist the theme of a journey back in time is particularly evocative during holidays associated with ancient past. Thus, the publicity for the archaeological site of David City, Il David, during the Sukkot holiday in 2008, lures visitors, and I quote, to travel in time in the place where it all began, end quote. The passage between layers of time, this is again a quote, transforms visitors to King David Citadel into the Hasmoneans during Hanukkah, and in Passover, they become ancient pilgrims from the Second Temple era. 
but a journey back in time can occur in a shopping mall or at a museum. Thus, the Museum of Biblical Land in Jerusalem, which is in itself a site of memory associated with antiquity, offers a diversity of educational programs in which children can meet and talk with figures from the ancient past. And here is an ad inviting people to meet uh, Antiochus and Jonathan the Maccabee and other historical figures associated with the stories of Hanukkah, or they can meet with Yos uh, biblical Yosef, Joseph, or they can meet with King Solomon. A private new tourist initiative named Tiul Tron, which combines the touring of the land tradition, Tiul, with theatrical performances, and that's how it came to the name Tiul Tron, um, combines this tradition of hiking with theatrical performances of biblical narratives in their historical geographical context. I quote, in every site, you will watch a short play that will transport you in time to the ancient valley, to the days of judges and kings. I couldn't resist showing this picture because you see my namesake right there. <laughs> Although actors perform these scenes for the two participants, Moving from one place to another, the publicity assures visitors that they can become active participants as minor characters, and thus can help shape the events. So you see how the, the interplay between present and the, the past and the present can even shape the Bible. Last October, the Judea and Samaria Council, which is called Yesha, an umbrella organization of the Jewish settlement in the West Bank, sponsored an expensive and highly visible campaign to bring Israeli visitors into its region during the week-long vacation of Sukkot. Targeting secular Israelis, the campaign featured images of smiling kids addressed in biblical costumes on large billboards in the, large, in the larger metropolitan area of Tel Aviv, the stronghold of secular Israeli culture. The, catch word, the, the catchphrase used in the ads Judea and Sumaria, the story of every Jew, Hasipur shel kol Yehudi, was all over the place. The heroic biblical tales are embedded in the consciousness of every one of, of us, it explained. These stories are part of our songs, our names, our streets, end quote. The campaign thus constructed a theme of Jewish unity around the biblical narratives that ignored the various conflicts around Judea and Sumaria. According to the media reports, Yesha's campaign drew thousands of Israelis to touring Judea and Samaria during the Sukkot break, thus successfully drawing on Israelis' tradition of going on trips, especially during the long holidays where the entire family is on vacation. But it also triggered harsh, harsh criticism. Yesha's website, website reported that its billboards were smeared with paint and painted over the count, the, and painted over with counter slogans. Some of them are actually smart Hebrew uh, play, word play that there was no way to translate. A blogger complained that, that I quote, the settlers speak to non-religious Israelis in Jewish rather than Israeli and claim that, I quote, the majority of the non-religious Israelis don't know the Jewish story and don't care about it. A well-known uh, cultural critic, Aviram Agolan, criticized the Disney-like photo of cute, ki cute kids dressed in biblical costumes that presents the reality in the West Bank, I quote, without the Palestinians, without fences, without soldiers, without violence. Similarly, another writer complained, I quote, three million, three million Palestinians, according to, to cautious estimates, live between Jordan and the Green Line. They do not exist in Yesha's in Yesha Council's campaign. To, f the, to further drive this point home, someone posted pictures of settlers attacking Palestinians under the heading, I quote, the story that every Jew must know. 
A cartoon published in the Israeli, in the Israeli daily Haaretz offered a similar inversion of the campaign's idyllic picture, highlighting the violence that underlies life in the West Bank. Relatively new tourist sites market to tourists the reenactment of the past as a way of experiencing ancient Jewish life in its authentic locus, some of them without having um, a specific archaeological or historical base. They derive their authenticity from a broader setting. This may be the land of Israel, or more specifically areas that are considered rich in history um, connected to antiquity, such as Modi'in, or the Judean Desert, or the Galilee, which deem to provide an appropriate backdrop for the reenactment of the past. The marketing rhetoric they use, these sites use, typically ensures pilgrims, tourists, and Israeli visitors a direct and authentic experience of antiquity through iconic and symbolic representations of the past. An interesting example of such a site is Neot Gdumim Park. Literally, Neot Gdumim can be translated into the ancient habitat park that was established, I quote, to recreate the physical setting of uh, of the Bible in all its depth and detail. The park bases its claim for authenticity on scientific knowledge. I quote, Neot Gdumim draws on a variety of disciplines such as the Bible scholarship, botany, zoology, geography, history, and archeology span to bring the Bible and its commentaries to life, end quote. The display of ancient structures associated with agriculture and a wide variety of plants that are mentioned in ancient sources is further supported by, co by a corresponding display of the verses. And you can see it right here. Thus reenacting also the tour, the tour the land tradition that combined hiking with textual reading. The publicity emphasizes that the ecological restoration brings contemporary visitors closer to the biblical, peop biblical people's um, experience. I quote, shaded rest areas throughout the reserve offer stunning views of the Israeli landscape, just as our forefathers saw it, end quote, and boasts to bringing to life, I quote again, the world of the Hebrew scriptures and the gospels, End quote. Thus, appealing to both Christians and Jews. It is interesting to note that the State of Israel awarded Neot Gdumim the highest prize, the prestigious Israel Prize in 1994. A small and isolated site in the Judean desert, Genesis Land, or Eretz Bereshit, is a relatively short distance from Jerusalem. Visitors to the site are given are given gowns to put, over, to put over their clothes and take a short trip on a, on a camel to be transported back 3,800 years to meet with Abraham the patriarch, <laughs> who is dressed in a short gown, <laughs> biblical sandals, and a white kaffia on his head. Abraham tells them about his voyage from his home back in Ur to the Promised Land following God's command before settling in this place. The performance calls on the hosts and the visitors to suspend the present in order to be symbolically transported to the past. Yet the contemporary Israeli who personifies Abraham playfully acknowledges the cultural and temporal gaps between the reenacted past and the present. Consider, for example, this ex exchange. Abraham, I do understand from Eliezer, his servant, um, that you traveled a long way, the group, yeah. Abraham, yeah, it's not easy to travel even in your time when you have these, those eagles with silver wings, yes? <laughs> it's a very tiring even just to get on them. And there are other examples, you know, that he alluded to the present. Another site, Kfar Kedem, which literally means an ancient village, so it's a generic, a generic name in itself, in the Galilee, invites visitors to come to, I quote, a recreated biblical village that, I quote, enables you to touch the past. 
In Kfar Kedem, we happily recreate the lives of our forefathers in the Galilee. I feel our connections in our lifestyle because we too live according to the Jewish law, to the halacha. This is end quote. Visitors can put on clothes, should, uh, can put on clothes, you know, the same biblical clothes, choose a variety from a variety of ancient activities, such as to become a shepherd, to bring in the harvest, to grind the floor, the flour and to bake the bread. Young children can also perform the ritual of receiving of the Torah, um, dressed in Jewish clothes, that's a quote, and reenact the Exodus from Egypt. The reintroduction of the past into the present, however, clearly has its limits. The publicity for Kfar Kedem notes, with some humor I must say, that Mount Sinai will be represented by the site's lawn. And in describing a festive meal in the shepherd's tent, which follows the tradition of those days, the text actually uses the Arabic term khafla, that is often used in Hebrew um, in reference to a Bedouin style hospitality. So there is an obvious incongruity with the claim, you know, for an ancient, uh, ancient biblical and the use of the, this term. Similarly, Genesis Land offers ancient hospitality kosher meat and dairy meals in a tent under the category of hafla. Thus, we can conclude that tasting antiquity involves a multi-layered multi experience that is both transcultural trans-religious and trans-historical. The acts of dressing up in an ancient looking garment and taking it off serves as an official marker of shifting tempor temporal frames between the commemorated past, antiquity, and the living present, modern Israel. Thus, while a group of tourists extends their merging of the past and the present while they're going on a camel ride, Abraham, the patriarch, who finished his shift, takes off the garment and rides away on a motorcycle. <laughs> fully, fully embraces modernity and the present. Similarly, the regional council of Yoav, it's an area near Jerusalem, has collaborated with Yad Yitzhak Ben Tzvi Institute in sponsoring an annual Bible Festival. The project has an obvious educational tool, a goal, to feature the continuing significance of the Bible through songs, dances, literature, plays, and traveling, but also programs that are not directly related to the Bible, but are just used in order to attract audiences. The success was proven in the large crowds estimated last year over 20,000 persons. The promotion of this region is designed, to, the promotion of this festival is clearly designed to promote tourism to this region. But relating to it as the Bible land, Eretz HaTanach, may also serve to show that Israel of the pre-1967 borders also has, can promote the love of Bible to contemporary Israelis, both secular and religious. So they did not really do it one-to-one, -one, the two campaigns that I'm uh, suggesting, but because this is an ongoing discourse in Israel, it is really interesting to compare the two. The commodification of antiquity for tourist consumption has gone further in an amusement park named King's City. In the resort desert town, El Elat, in the southern tip of Israel, which publicizes its attraction as the first experience park in Israel that connects to the biblical kings, and especially to King Solomon, who is associated with that area. Influenced by Disney-like theme park approach, King City offers biblical scene as a backdrop for rides that have biblical names. The use of the Bible as a marketing device for Israeli entertainment and tourism industries contributes a, se uh, contributes a sense that beyond the fun, these activities and products may have an educational value thanks to their connection to the Bible. But the commodification of the Bible may also serve as evidence of its less sacred status right now in Israeli society. Representing antiquity has thus evolved its own conventions that operate simultaneously at various levels within the culture. 
themes such as inspiring the present with the past, the land as a site of memory that brings the past into the present, encounters with ancient figures that lead to the formation of symbolic community of ancient people with the modern Israelis, have long been encoded in religious, folk, and literary expressions. These themes have been employed by the tourist industry to the Holy Land and to contemporary Jewish Israel. The commodification of antiquity for tourist consumption uses authenticity and, travel and time travel to promote cultural reproductions that may range from a low-tech approach of live performances by contemporary Israelis as stands-ins for their ancestors, or can be as high technic technologi technologically um, projecting scenes from the past into the present as the new Masada Museum shows. In the words that I borrow from an ad for the Beit She'an Archaeological Park, uh, Park, the most advanced future technology carries you back thousands of years. Okay. And now uh, feel free to ask questions uh, regarding the lecture. And, and you can use, obviously, the microphones. Shalom. Shalom. Um, my name is Hannah Pressman, or Hannah Pressman. I'm an affiliate faculty here at the University of Washington. I wanted to thank you for your enlightening talk and to tell you that Recovered Roots was a very influential book for me as an undergraduate uh, when I started to study contemporary Israel, so to Daraba. Um, I was struck by your illustrations of sites that provide a, quote, authentic experience of antiquity and this use of the word authentic to describe Israelis' uh, connection with the ancient past. And my question is about this word authenticity and kind of how it changes for internal audiences and external audiences, meaning um, has the uh, authentic experience of the past changed for Israelis over the decades and what are some factors internally in Israeli society that have contributed to that change? And then also uh, looking at um, insiders and outsiders, how uh, tourists and non-Israeli Jews and then non-Jewish tourists, um, how they uh, experience authentic, the authentic past differently. So kind of looking internally and then internally versus externally, how that, that sense of authenticity has changed over the years. Well, it's a great question. And of course, I'm not going to do justice in being able to, be, to answer all the subtleties that are implied in your very question. And let me say first that the appeal of the Bible, as we have discussed, is mostly in the secular national Israeli culture and probably for the religious Zionists. But of course, I did not say it, and I should say it clearly. It does not apply to the ultra-Orthodox, to the Haredi Jews. I mean, all this is out of their very range. Um, the, word of, the word authenticity um, I believe, according to my observation so far, and it's really work in uh, progress, um, comes more now than it used to be in the past. In the past, Israelis took very seriously the identification with the, with the ancient figures. You didn't have to use authenticity because nobody doubted that. Actually, because of the reproduction of antiquity, um, there is more need to use the term in order to convince that this is really the true thing. So there is no question that in to the tourist uh, discourse, this is very much used. And the tourists I include very broadly, and it's for Israelis as well as um, Jewish tourists and Christian tourists. Um, when I was in this uh, doing observation in this uh, site that I uh, mentioned, Genesis land, Eretz Bereshit. I was, uh, I so happened to, the, there was an American uh, Jewish group there. And when Abraham the patriarch, you know, gave his speech about how he traveled and how from Ur whatever, and then he ended, the guy next to me, you know, they, they looked at me and said, was Abraham really here or did they just say that? I mean, he wasn't really sure whether, you know, how authentic is the information that is known. Israelis, I think, take it more tongue in cheek and it's done a lot, a lot of the activities that are done are for families, for children. So there is the performative element. The frame of the play is much more pronounced. Um. As you spoke about this concept of Yisraelit as a language that Zuckerman mm. was talking about, it's interesting that you mentioned that he's saying that, well, modern 
Hebrew has a lot more Yiddish in it or seems to come from that, given that Yiddish might have been the choice for the state of Israel as its language, but Hebrew was chosen instead. And the great sort of the difference between the whole concept of Israel is not looking back toward Eastern Europe as its home. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yes, actually that I will discuss much more in the second, in the coming lectures when I talk about the changing attitude to uh, the period of exile and exilic traditions. And in some ways I think this is the most fascinating uh, part of the changes in Israeli memory as I will discuss more you know, in the next lecture. But there are, I just want to say, it's not like this is a generally agreed upon conclusion. Zuckerman, as you can <laughs> guess, has been also attacked in Israel for coming out with this uh, thesis. But I bring it in because, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you wouldn't have believed that somebody claim, everybody says, well, okay, you know, the Bible has become more difficult, Israeli kids, you know, Hebrew is not what it used to be, to be. the present is not what it used to be, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> the idea that it's a foreign language, the idea that you need translation from biblical Hebrew to modern Hebrew was really, but the uh, observation of the ties between the exilic uh, language, Yiddish, that he, modern Hebrew was supposed to be, you know, the, the, the recovery uh, from uh, Yiddish, that to claim that modern Hebrew was so much affected by Yiddish is really part of what is happening in Israel now um, that I will discuss in my next lecture. Okay.